Hey, thanks so much for joining us for the weekly message for Connection Church. My name is Steve. Hey, uh, hopefully you joined us last week for our Celebration Sunday and Chili Cook-Off. We had so much fun. There was such great food there, and it was great to see so many of you there, uh, and great to meet a few new people as well. Um, if you were with us last week, we are kicking off a new series um, called How We Roll. And we had some fun last week in starting to talk about some things that are connected with this series and just this idea that well, we're going to take a few weeks to look at the roles at, at a foundational level that God has given us as people. Obviously, we're not going to get to all the roles he's given us, but we're going to tap into just a few. Uh, and some of them are going to be super challenging. I, all of them are going to be super challenging on some level because we are very selfish creatures. We like to have control. We like to have our comfort. And honestly, some of it really bucks against that. And it's partially due because we just kind of feel like we know what's best. There's almost that innate feeling in us. And I don't know I don't know what to say, what feelings go along with the fact of when you realize that you don't know what's best all the time or much of the time. Sometimes that can be scary. But when we believe that God is in control and that he has something in store for us that is good, there can be a lot of freedom in in letting go and beginning to trust God and the plans that he has for us. So we're going to take a look at some of the responsibilities that go along with these roles as well. Last week, we talked about this concept that when there's tension in conversations, a lot of times it's due to the fact that two people aren't defining things the same way. And we kind of brought that into our own lives in the sense that when there's tension and conflict and challenge in our lives, there's, it begs the question, are we defining things maybe differently than God is in this life that he is calling us to? Because if, if so, there's going, to be some, there's going to be some tension and some challenge with that. Take, for example, the idea of, of having a good life or having a full life or having fun in life. I mean, these are three things right there that we can define, end up defining so differently than God. And so then we just, we actually are convinced in and of ourselves that God doesn't have what's good planned for us. Or we can't have fun if we're following what he's asking us to do. And so it's just this, is, kind of like a, like an imbalance or this a way that we're not really connecting with God because we're defining things differently. And these are foundational things a lot of the times. And so last week we looked at the idea of submitting, you know, all of us submitting to authority. And we really wrestled with it sometimes because we think, well, that authority doesn't deserve to be submitted to. But that's not, that's not really what God is calling us to. God has instituted an order of things. He has allowed us to be in positions where there is an authority over us in, in lots of different arenas. And our, our job is to submit to those authorities, not because it's super fun all the time, but because it's what God's asked us to do. And sometimes that will be some of the greatest displays of his power in your life is giving you the ability to submit to your boss when he's being irrational or even when he's wrong. It's not always our responsibility to point out everybody, you know, where they're making mistakes. Sometimes it is our responsibility to just say, okay, and we move along. We talked that the one time we are definitely not supposed to submit to leadership is when, or authority, is when they are asking us to do something that is sinful or contrary to what we know 
God has called us to in his word. So essentially sin. Those are the moments and they're actually far fewer than we, than we think. Um, there's a lot of times where it's just hard or it's just difficult, difficult, or it's just our pride getting in the way. Last week, we looked at uh, Ephesians. We looked at a section of Ephesians and we ended verse 21 in Ephesians 5 that says, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. And so we see that shift, not submitting to one another because they deserve it, but out of reverence for Christ. It becomes an act of worship. How cool is that? The enemy wants to convince us that these people don't deserve for us to to submit to them or, you know, we've worked too hard. Why would we submit? Whatever it is that the enemy is feeding us to believe. When the perspective shift is, wow, this is an opportunity to worship God in how I submit to other people, right? It's not always just an authority in our life. He was just submitting to the people that make up part of your faith community. So our focus is on Jesus as we submit to one another, not on what someone deserves. So how we roll. Getting something as basic as our roles, as defined by the Lord, by Jesus, we say we serve, it's not only an act of worship, but it's also an act of obedience that always leads to blessing. Always. Now, we don't do it for that reason. But God has just got this built in that when we are obedient to the things that he's calling us to do, there's blessing in it. Maybe we're just getting to know him better. Maybe we're getting to know his voice better when he's asking us to do things. There's always blessing. And both worship and obedience take on a greater value when they're done in difficulty and seasons of challenge. We know this. When the struggle is harder, the victory is all the sweeter. Okay, so shifting gears, maybe just a little. Today, we're actually going to pick up right where we left off in Ephesians in a few minutes. We're also going to look at another section of Scripture. So much of the external life that we live, that you live, is influenced by your internal state. Like, we know this. Right? How you are on the outside is often a reflection of maybe how things are going on the inside. Now, listen, some of us, maybe you, maybe at different times, you can hide what's on the inside. But eventually it comes out. And the same can be said for our home life a lot of the time and outside of home life. Right? So you just think of it this way. If you're family life, family situation is not going well. It's not always easy to mask that on the outside. It presents challenges for us in other things that we thought maybe were unrelated. Our patience is less. Our frustration is higher. We begin to view people maybe differently based on how things are going at home with a husband, with a wife, with kids, with parents that don't know your living situation. Right? Like our home life, especially if we spend some time there, if we're close with those people, can influence the outside of home life. And like we've already said, if we're not defining things the same way God is, we can't be surprised if things are challenging or, or tension-filled in certain areas of our life. And this includes some at-home dynamics, especially between husbands and wives, which is what we're going to zero in on a little bit, uh, or a lot, in, in our, our time together today. And listen, if you're not married, still stay tuned in. There's a lot of helpful info in this. Um, it's God's truth. And there's kind of a way we're going to tie this all together it's going to mean a lot for you as well. But let me pray before we dig any deeper. 
God, thank you so much uh, for how you love us. God, thank you that you are so interested and you care so deeply about us that you you want to be involved in every aspect of our lives and you are wanting to see us live a full abundant life we know jesus says that but we need to swallow our pride sometimes a lot of the time maybe we need to lay down how we are defining things or maybe just how we've gotten used to things or, or, or how we've experienced things to be maybe even good for a little while. But God, I just pray that you would help us to lay every aspect of our life down so that we can make sure we're defining it the same way. God, please help us as we look into your word in these few sections of scripture. There can be a lot of emotion wrapped up in in this even already just talking about wives and husbands god i just pray peace over everyone listening and watching god and that we would all be open to what you're wanting to say to us in this you truly want a good and full life for us and that's found in living life how you are calling us to well, thanks for this time in jesus name amen okay we're going to take a couple of sections of scripture that have gotten quite a bit of attention over the years since they were written, probably. But maybe they actually haven't had thorough consideration and application in the times that you've heard about them or talked through them or maybe heard them even communicated to you. The first section, we're going to kind of move through a little quicker. And then we're going to camp a little bit more um, in the second section. So the first section is 1 Peter 3. So you can flip there um, in your Bibles. You can head there on new version. Again, the scripture will be up on the screen. But man, get a, get a Bible. Get a physical Bible. Have it so you can underline it. So 1 Peter 3 is actually what we're going to look at. 1 Peter 2, the end of it, uh, is just important to know because 1 Peter 3 starts off with the word likewise in the ESV. So obviously Paul, uh, or sorry, Peter is, is speaking to something. He's comparing something here to what has just been said. And so 1 Peter 2 verses 13 to 25, he's talking about submitting to authority. Okay, so you can read that yourself. Um, you can dive into that, but that's what he's talking about. He's talking about this whole idea of submitting to authority. And then he becomes a little more specific as we jump into 1 Peter 3. Let's just jump in. He says this, 1 Peter 3, again, this is ESV, starting in verse 1. He says, Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of of their wives when they see your respectful and pure conduct. Don't let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which, is, which in God's sight is very precious. For this is how holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel since they are heirs with you of the grace of life so that your prayers may not be hindered. Okay, I feel like I say this every week, but man, I'd like to be in the room with you. Our home group, I'm, I'm excited that I'm in, in the room with you because man, I just wanna know what, what are the feelings that you're having as we read through a section of scripture like that. A lot of you probably heard this before. We're gonna take a quick dive into a few points 
in this section of scripture that are really, really important for us to understand as we read God's truth here. And that's the first thing. As we read scripture, we cannot pick and choose as to what we think is is actually God's word for us and what isn't. We believe that this is God's word from start to finish all the way through. It's not something we just like pick and choose, like those choose your own adventure books. I used to love those growing up. They are not the Bible. They are something that is fiction and fake. And we bring that sometimes into scripture because we like certain parts, like where God wants to bless us. We love, oh, that's the word of God right there. But when it comes to the hard and challenging things, maybe that we understand but don't like, or maybe it's the parts that we don't really understand. We are very quick to push them to the side. And and don't get me wrong, I think we all have the temptation to do that a lot of times. Let's just jump back to verse one. Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands. So be subject to them. There's this idea of submitting to your own husbands. We mentioned last week, there's nowhere in scripture that just says, it's a blanket statement, all women must submit to all men. Okay, this is very specific. Peter is talking about specifically in the family unit. He says, so that even if some do not obey the word, if if you're married to someone who is not a Christian or, or someone who says they are, and they are not living according to the word, It says, in you being subject to them, in you submitting to them, they may be, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see your respectful and pure conduct. Listen, these are super important words right here. Peter is saying, hey, it's got to be respectful. It's not this like submitting out of spite. Um, I feel like we've all done that as kids to our parents. You know, they ask you to do something and you're like, you know, you have a look on your face and your body is speaking of the attitude you are carrying. Oh, you're going to do what they asked you to do. But there is like zero respect there. I mean, parents quite easily pick up on that. But I mean, we have this in relationships all over the place. When we are doing something for somebody and we carry an awful attitude. Listen, that is not what Peter is speaking of. He is speaking of that it would be done in a respectful manner and pure conduct. Again, this is so hard to do if our focus, women, if your focus in in submitting yourselves, being subject to your husbands, is purely based on whether they deserve it or not. I mean, could there Could there be a more intense situation than if you, as a woman who is married to somebody who's not a Christian or who's not living it out, could there be a more intense charged situation when you're trying to live according to God's word and they're not, and you're you're supposed to submit to them respectfully and out of pure conduct? So hard. And this is why it's so great that What's suggested in God's word by Paul in Ephesians was this idea that, listen, listen, we're doing it out of reverence for Christ, right? And that's the thing that Peter is speaking of here, that maybe, maybe that as you submit to your husband in ways of serving him and loving him and in pure conduct, that may be the view of Jesus that he gains that ends up softening his heart to then come to the Lord. The reality is husbands, and we're going to get to husbands in in a couple minutes, but how husbands love and sacrifice themselves for their wives, it's it's the same situation. If your wife is not a Christian and not living it out, how you serve her may be the very thing that opens her eyes to the love of Jesus. Verse three, he says, do not let your adorning be external. In other words, your, the way you make yourself beautiful, 
the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear. In, in the original um, language, it's sometimes translated in the fine apparel, but the word fine is not even in there. So we know that Peter is not saying you, you can't take care of yourself and dress nicely. His focus is, hey, don't just make it about what's on the outside because that's, it's empty. Verse four, he says, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit. And a lot of us know this to be true. You don't get into a relationship that you are hoping will be long-term based purely on what someone looks like on the outside. If that is the case, we may very well be disappointed because beauty on the outside fades. We know clothes wear out. Seems to be faster for women than men, right? Guys, a lot of guys. You have what, three pairs of jeans and four sweaters that you've had for 25 years? But it still, it fades. Beauty on the outside eventually fades. But Peter's saying, listen, it's Sure, whatever you want to do to take care of yourself is fine, but let your adorning, the way that you would make yourself appealing and, and to draw your husband to yourself, is not just with the outside stuff. It's who you are. A gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. And here, right in this moment, we see this is where we are defining things so differently than society. Because so much of our society is caught up, not so much on building up who you are, women, as a gentle and quiet spirit, but it is often about the outside. And it, it's often not about having a gentle and quiet spirit either. It's having a you know, charge into the war beside your man because you're no less than him on any level. And we're going to get into that in a minute, a, a little bit. But th there is this loud and take charge that our society is saying, because women, you will be put down no longer. I couldn't agree more that women shouldn't be put down, but our roles, as described by God in Scripture, are different in a few areas. Verse 5 says, For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves. And so as we've talked before, we need a culture in our churches, in our faith circles, where there is someone mentoring you, that you are learning from, and someone also that you are helping grow. It's this Paul-Timothy idea. Timothy was learning from Paul, and so a catchphrase in a lot of churches is everyone needs a Paul and a Timothy. You need someone you're learning from and someone you are bringing along under you. And so it's kind of what Peter is saying here. Hey, you know, those women of faith that you looked up to, this is how they made themselves beautiful. They were most concerned about who they were on the inside. He says, by submitting to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. Now, before you lose your mind and say, I am not calling my husband Lord, we're not suggesting that you do. This, and we've talked about this before, a small case L on the word Lord simply means master. And you're like still rolling up your sleeves right now. You're saying that's not any better. I'm not calling my husband master. It's not. Again, it's the heart behind it. It's, it's that title of that mentality, that understanding that, hey, I have entered into this relationship and I, I believe that I want to follow what God is asking of me in this life that Jesus purchased when he died on the cross. And so my life is not my own. So we look to scripture to say, how do you want me to live, God? And he's saying, wives, there is this mentality you should have in serving your husband. We're going to talk a little bit more in, in that in just a minute. So just go with me on this. And it says, and you are her children. In other words, you are part of the family of women of faith 
if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. In other words, part of the ripple effect of coming under your husband, submitting under your husband and being part of that family unit like God has it designed is that you don't need to fear because not only is God for you and fighting for you, but so is your husband. Verse seven, likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Listen, there's a couple things we have to just touch on really quickly here. Live with them. Can I just say that unfortunately, as relationships continue, a lot of people stop living with each other. They don't, they don't live. Do you know what I mean? They might, <laughs> here's confusing for you. They live with each other, but they don't live with each other. They exist with each other. You know what I mean? Like on, on the side of you share a home with them. You, you eat along with them. You maybe share a bed with them, right? But, but you're not living with them, enjoying life with them. This is part of what Peter is saying because the, I, the kind of the concept, this uh, not concept, but this painting with a broad brush, men are not always as sensitive and attuned to the small things that matter to women. I'm painting with a broad brush. Some guys do a great job of this. But Peter is saying, guys, don't just be concerned with the things that you care about and go about your life. He's saying, live with your wives there's an emphasis that needs, we can't miss on this and we can't diminish. Live with your wives. And he adds to it in an understanding way. Can I just ask when, guys, if you are married, when is the last time you were like physically or mentally taking notes on your wife in a, in a good way? <laughs> not all the things she does that makes you frustrated or ticked off. I mean, when's the last time, and I don't care how long you've been together for, when's the last time you were taking note of something about your wife, something that made her laugh, something that just made her day when you said or did something that you didn't necessarily expect was going to have the impact on her. Maybe you just, whenever you're at Costco, you're somewhere, and you just had this fleeting thought run through your head. I'm going to buy her flowers. <laughs> For no reason. You just thought, I'm going to buy her flowers. And you brought them home, and, and it was like you bought her a car. Okay? She was just so thankful for that. Did you take note of that? Did you, did you kind of log that away as like, hey, I need to remember that she really loves that. Maybe it's, you know, you get home from work and I don't know what your job is, but before changing out of your work clothes or washing your hands even, you walk over to her and you kiss her first before you do anything else. I don't know what it is, but Peter, I think, is being very, very intentional in this section of scripture saying, Live, live with your wives in an understanding way. It takes effort. It takes time. It takes energy. It's going to take a lot of guys stepping outside of who they naturally are to really care to understand their wives. It says showing honor to the woman as the weaker <laughs> vessel. We're going to let you guys take care of defining that one in your small groups. I'm just kidding. We're not. That would be so mean. Man, this is such a, oh, this is such a charged section of this scripture. I mean, showing honor. Absolutely. That's easy. In the, in the concept, it's one thing we like. 
showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel. Peter is painting with a broad brush here. Okay, again, the majority, the majority, go with me, of men who are married are stronger physically than their wives. Okay, listen, I recognize some of you women could take your husband in a second. You could take him out, you could armbar, whatever, MMA him, however you want. You could do that. Peter is painting with a broad brush here just in, in saying, hey, even though she may be the weaker vessel, it, and it's actually the original word here, woman, speaks to like the femininity, right? Which again, just a couple verses up, he's putting emphasis on that, hey, again, make the focus that quiet and gentle spirit. Generally something that comes a little easier, generally a little easier to women than men. And so there can be this stereotype. We know that men are big and strong and loud and women are the ones who care deeply and who are thoughtful and this, and sure, so looking from the outside, we see, oh, the woman may be weaker. Think of this in the idea that when we would give honor and, and submit, just in our natural sense, to someone else, it's usually because they have something over us. Power, strength, uh, some sway. But Peter is saying, hey, from the outside, there might not be a reason that you would think you should honor your wife. I know that sounds so harsh, but women, if we were to take a poll, which we're not absolutely not going to do, on how well your husband lives and understands and honors you in a way that you were just, you're, you're taken aback by. I wonder, I'm not, I'm not saying, do you believe your husband thinks that way? I mean, is it lived out? Why not? <sighs> right? There's so many reasons around here, but this is why we need to, if we're claiming to be Jesus followers, orient our lives in full surrender to God's word. And so he's saying, hey, wives, submit to your husbands. Honor them in the same sense that they are going to live and understand and honor you. And he, and he says, here's, here's why, guys, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, okay? Because he's saying, hey, despite how things may appear on the outside, they are heirs with you. They are equal heirs with you of the grace of life in the spiritual side of things, in what Jesus has planned for all of us for the rest of eternity. Men, women, we are equal heirs in the grace of life. And then he throws on this like dagger and so that your prayers may not be hindered. Guys, how many prayers have been hindered because we're not honoring our wives like we should be. We're not living with them. We're not understanding them. And we're not honoring them. Please hear me. Don't make these changes so that your prayers can go and be heard better. But we need to know that there's repercussions to this. And this is exactly what Peter's pointing out. Okay, we're going to we're going to quickly jump over to Ephesians 5. I'm sorry, you have you have questions or whatever. Um we're going to hopefully get some time to answer those in home group wherever you are. I want to switch over to Ephesians 5. And I, I'm sorry we're like pushing it with time here, but we have to jump into this one. We just have to. Ephesians 5, we ended last week with verse 21 submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ, right? This is this lens that we're, 
we're bringing to this idea of submission, not because people deserve it, but because Jesus does. He deserves our, uh, our whole life, and he's asking us to do this. So verse 22, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. So we see this is kind of like the first reason why. Submit to your husbands as to the Lord. Again, he's bringing this lens. Paul is bringing this lens into it. Of Here's your reason why. Because you need to do it like you would be doing it for the Lord. It means you recognize that there's an order of authority and that you are part of a unit, a team, right? This is where we can't just pick and choose things and choose to ignore some sections of Scripture and choose to believe others. Last week, we mentioned this idea that rank has to do with order and authority, not with value or ability, right? So it's not in your submitting to your husband. You're not saying you are less than. You are just in a different position than him. Submission means submission, right? Like there is a mission for the Christian marriage. And that mission is obeying and glorifying God. And so it can be thought of kind of in this way. I'm going to put myself under the mission. That mission is more important than my individual desires. I'm not putting myself below my husband. I'm putting myself below the mission God has for our marriage and for our life. But again, it's not done in a nasty attitude of just like, and, and we and women, don't voice that to your husbands. If you're having a hard day, like submitting to your husband because he's being a doorknob, don't say, hey, I'm going to do this because because I, I, I'm doing it for Jesus, not you, <laughs> okay? That's, that's not going to help the situation. Listen, the Bible never commands, we said this before, this idea that general submission of all women to men. Paul's being very specific, your own husbands, right? This may sound completely old school to you, but as we mentioned last week, our society has diminished like almost on almost every level it's respect for authority. And where, honestly, where has that gotten us? Do we feel safe? Do you feel as safe as you did when you were a kid growing up? Probably not. Do we have less or more crime? Do we have more or, or less mental health issues? I'm not saying that the solution to all of these is this, but could it be that our drift from God's design and God's defining of roles has helped lead us to a lot of the mess that we find ourselves in in our society. The enemy is absolutely at work in the corruption of authority and the rejection of authority. To which you might say, yes, if it weren't for the corruption of authority, then I wouldn't reject authority. But again, if that's our stance, we're, we're completely in the wrong because we're doing it for the wrong reasons. We're not doing it for Christ as to the Lord. Our motive for submission is to be first because God has established an order and is asking us to honor him and his design. And again, some of our greatest moments of displaying the power of Jesus and the Holy Spirit in our lives may be submission when it's most difficult. Listen again, as to the Lord, this idea of favoring, the idea of how it gets misused in some senses is when it favors the husband, okay? That the husband is essentially God himself. And this is obviously an awful interpretation of it, but if you've been around church for a while, you've probably heard a section of scripture like this misused, where women are just to submit blankly as to the Lord, like 
oh, your husband is pretty much God. It's not the case. Not at all. And that's a absolutely wrong interpretation of it, and it's, it's the abuse of Scripture in that sense. There's also a wrong interpretation that favors the wife, that kind of says, well, I'm going to interpret as to whether my husband is living as the Lord would, and if he is, I will submit, and if he isn't, then I won't. Well, this leaves the woman kind of like figuring out and deciding based on feeling a lot of the time whether whether their husband is living up to how Jesus would live or not. And if that's the case, they're never going to submit to your husband because your husband is going to make mistakes. And so again, it's out of reverence to the Lord. It's out of a focus to Jesus. Jesus, I'm going to submit to my husband as I am submitting to you. So it's not that it, it defines the extent or the limit of submission, but the motive behind it. Submit to your husbands as to the Lord. So moving on to verse 23, for the husband is the head of the wife. So Paul is giving kind of a breakdown of the example here. For the husband is the head of the wife. This, this use of this word head here, we see in other places in scripture, it's used as source and authority. And Paul is, Paul could be meaning both here, but the stress is on authority. I mean, dialing it back in creation, we see that man is the source of woman. Woman was taken from his rib, right? But in this, he is speaking to the authority. For the, for the husband is the authority of the wife, even as Christ is the head or the authority of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Verse 24, now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. And here's this parallel that we're seeing now, unfortunately, is, is that the church isn't submitting to Christ the same as it used to. There's a lot of picking and choosing. There's a lot of, uh, yeah, deconstructing faith that's going on that's super not healthy. And it is that picking and choosing. And what we're seeing as well is, is that same thing mirrored in a lot of relationships. Women maybe are submitting to their husbands the same way a lot of churches are submitting to Christ in a picking and choosing sort of way. And that's not what God's calling us to. It's not how he's defined the roles to be, and it's not his best for us in those, in those relationships. So now we're switching gears. Verse 25, husbands, love your wives. This is not, this is not just get them a Hallmark card every once in a while that says love in it. This, this echoes what Peter's saying, like live with them in understanding and honor love your wives. And he defines it. And he sets the bar so high. People who use this section of scripture and get so mad that, wow, like scripture is so old and barbaric. It's asking women to submit to their husbands. Man, keep reading if you think that women have the tougher job. I'm, I'm not saying that it's not hard. They are both positions are hard. Husband love, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Jesus came to earth, we know this. He was ridiculed and made fun of and, and abused and beat up for things that he didn't deserve, and yet it was his love for the church, his love for his people, that he was willing to get beat up for things he didn't do, die on a cross, put there by the some of the very people he came to save. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. Paul is saying all this to speak to the fact that Jesus' motive Right, What we were just talking about, motive is the key. Jesus' motive was far beyond the, the challenge of what he would have to go through. And this is the same. Man, 
Husbands, can I just say, painting with a broad brush, husbands are not loving their wives to the extent that we should be in this way that Christ loved the church. We have so many reasons why we don't want to sacrifice self or our pride or our control over a situation. Man, you want to talk about submission? There's a lot of submission found in how husbands are to love their wives because Christ submitted. Christ submitted to all kinds of things. He shouldn't have had to as Jesus. Verse 28, in the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. <laughs> he who loves his he who loves his wife loves himself. Listen, this one's a really a little bit tougher to understand because some men, we need to be loving our wives better than we love our bodies because we don't, we don't take care of our bodies like we should. But Paul's sentiment here is that there is this innate self-preservation that's built into us, right? We don't enjoy going through pain as a default. Beyond that, we like our comfort. We like providing for ourselves. You have some time to yourself. What do you do? You don't make life harder for yourself. You maybe sit on the couch and put your feet up. You provide for your own self. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. Underscoring really that we are one with our wives. I love this quote. It says, a man who can only rule or have authority by stamping his foot had better remain single. But a man who knows how to govern his house by the love of the Lord through sacrificial submission to the Lord is the man who's going to make a perfect husband. The woman who cannot submit to an authority like that had better remain single. I love that quote because it speaks, it sets the bar so high for both people the husband and the wife. So wrapping up, sorry, we're pushing it with time, but th there's just too much. There was just so many other things we could have talked about here as well. But so what is it that God's getting at with, with passages of scriptures like these? I mentioned it off the top. I think in, in John 10, 10, when Jesus says, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Okay, this is what we have to keep in mind. This is Jesus defining one of the reasons why he came and, and is going to give his life is so that we could have life and have it to the full. It's not so that we could be oppressed and, and not have any fun in life and live a, a diminished life. Jesus is speaking to the opposite of that. So Jesus is calling us to a full and abundant life as we pattern our lives after him. And as we define our roles, how God is defining them. And what do we see as a constant thread through Jesus' life? Among a number of things, submission to his Father, with whom he was one. Husbands and wives are one. There is this great bar that is set that we don't like sometimes because it gets in the way of self and our pride and our control, but it is the way to an abundant life. If you're not married, maybe this message is a little tough to swallow right now. And you, maybe you're just thinking, what, what is in this for me? This, this is sucks. This is sucks. This sucks. You're just, you're talking about something I don't have. There is there is application for you in this. It, it's not that far from actually what I just mentioned. If you have no spouse, but you're a Jesus follower, you are part of the church who is referred to as the bride of Christ. So if you're single and a woman, you have the best husband ever. If you're single, and a man, I'll admit, it's a little weird to think of yourself as the bride of Christ. <laughs> but what doesn't change 
is what he's asking us to do in living our lives for him. And he will meet us. He has far exceeded any relationship we could ever experience. So all of our submissions really are first and foremost to Christ. As we've been talking about how the wife submits to her husband, and Jesus has already shown that he gives his life for each of us. Ah, th thanks. Thanks for just staying. If you didn't stop watching the video, thanks. Thanks for sticking with it this long. I hope you have great discussion about this. Dig into God's word. Talk about the frustrations that you have, the experiences that you have that are coloring your view of this, maybe. Or maybe, with some of the discussion on this, it's shed new light on this. And there's a freedom and excitement in you in regards to some of this. Let me just pray. God, thank you so much that you love us to the degree that you do. Thank you for your word. I just want to apologize that we sometimes have taken aspects of our life and we've defined them how we want instead of laying it all down before you. So please help us with these sections of scripture. Maybe these ones we've gone over today are really tough and difficult for people, um, some more than others. God, please help us with that. Be our strength. Change our heart to be more aligned with yours on some of these things. And God, if there's anyone listening or watching that hasn't surrendered their life to you and this idea of love and sacrifice, just it, it's resonating with them. And, and they have gotten to a point of believing that you are who you say you are. That Jesus, you gave your life to pay the penalty for our sin. You, you were dead. That was the penalty for, for sin. But you didn't stay dead. You were raised to life again and you will return for your bride, the church. I just pray that anyone who hasn't made that decision would say yes to that right now and know what it is to experience your love. Thanks for this time and that you'll go with us into the rest of today and this weekend and the coming weeks. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks again. We'll see you soon.